And, uh, and a conversation it is, so uh, please at any time uh, uh, jump right in and with, with comments and, uh, and questions and, and corrections. And uh, there, are, there are printed copies in the back, uh, back center aisle, I think, if you don't have anything. Now, I will try to stand right here for the, for the duration for two reasons. One is uh, a good comment last time that I was evidently when talking and going like this or something <laughs> similar and blocking the view. And I'll try not to do that. The second thing is I forgot my reading glasses, so I'm gonna have to uh, <laughs> be nice and close. And I'm not wearing your reading glasses. <laughs> Look like Elton John and then People are going to be turned away from this church. <laughs> no, that's fine. Let's we'll do this. If I squint, well, anyway, so here you have in your handout uh, 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 a review, just a brief review of the first 12 chapters, and uh, I'll just leave those in there if you want to look at them and peruse them, that's fine. Um, yes. Uh, I'm, I'll be all right, but thank you. I'll be all right. I'll, I'll stand right here. It'll keep me, keep me planted where I should be. So we'll, we'll go right to chapter 13. We'll look at chapter 13 and 14, and chapter 13 is, is grace. So grace is often defined with a well-known acronym. And do any of you recall what that acronym is? stands for. Yes, God's Lynn. Riches at God's riches at Christ. Did you see this? <laughs> Read the answer. Okay. <laughs> it's my sister-in-law, Lynn, so I feel I can <laughs> harass her just a little bit more. <laughs> All right, so God's riches at Christ's expense. So uh, let's start with at Christ's, uh, at Christ's expense. What, is, what does at Christ's expense mean? Well, the Son of God took on flesh. And is it, I, I think many of us here know these, but to me it's always a wonderful thing to, to read through and describe because it's totally mind-blowing and unimaginable that God himself, not a God who's just slightly greater than us, but it was so far beyond anything that we could ever imagine, took on flesh. Uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was conceived in and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered the uh, humiliations of human frailty without any sin of thought, word, or deed. He endured abuse by those who owed him worship. And he died on the cross for the sins of us, his abusers. And he rose again in victory over death and sin. So this was all at Christ's expense. Uh, we did not participate in this work at all. And in fact, you know, before we come to Christ, outside of Christ, as Romans 5 makes very clear, we don't even want to participate. We don't, we don't want a part of this. Um, and that being said, although we, you know, we are victors in Christ, we, we still, in this life, battle the flesh. So what are, what are some of God's riches? Well, the gift of his work on our behalf is, first of all, pardon from our sin, forgiveness. And just and more than being just forgiven for our sins, the righteousness that belongs to Christ was imputed, reckoned, declared to be ours. And more than that, we are adopted as God's children. We are given gifts to be used for the church and the community, and then we are going to receive a, an internal inheritance. So let's look at these in just slightly, uh, a little bit more detail and um, if you all will be so kind to, uh, uh, let's read a couple of these verses. Um, 
Let's start with pardon for our sins, those uh, God's riches. Uh, Romans 3.24. Dan, yes, thank you. Uh, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Uh, Philippians 3 9. Maybe some we can keep one step ahead of the game here. And being found in him, not having righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness. Adoption as, as God's children. Let's look at John 1.12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And Ephesians 1. Verses 4 through 5. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And he has given us... Uh, we're not going to read through all these, but he has given us a purpose in this life. So uh, we are adopted as children, but there's a, we, ha we have a, a, a reason to live. We have, a, we, uh, we have spiritual gifts. Uh, many are outlined in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, to do every good deed. And, you know, we're to build up the body of the church, but uh, we are also to seek the welfare of the city, um, as uh, Jeremiah says. And, you know, there are many places we can read about, uh, obviously, having an eternal inheritance. So, there are, you know, there are some common misunderstandings about what God's uh, grace is. Um, some feel that God's grace is carte blanche. Uh, Get out of jail free. That's a very, very loose translation of the French. Um, you know, to live according to your own rules because you know, God has saved you and, and made you new. And you're, you're not condemned by the law anymore, so uh, we don't need to follow the law anymore. And that's a, that's a misunderstanding. Um, you know, the God has reduced his expectations of us. And that's a, that's a, re, a misunderstanding. Um, since the law no longer condemns us to eternal hell, we are no longer bound by the law all in this life. Well, Romans uh, 6 is a correction to that misunderstanding. So I just grabbed a few, uh, few phrases from that. Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. Our old self was crucified with him so that we would no longer be Slaves to sin. So, uh, Machen said, uh, a low view of law, uh, that's God's moral laws expressed in the Bible, always brings legalism in religion. It's a high view of law that makes a man a seeker after grace. And so, that's kind of a, a reversal of, of uh, you know, what many people think. Many people say that when, you're, uh, when you have a high view, when you're obsessed with, with God's moral law, that's what makes you a legalist. But Machen opines that, uh, he argues that it's when you have a low view of God's moral law, when it, when it doesn't really apply, uh, apply to us anymore. And that's what produces legalism because... He says, a low view of God's moral law causes us to conclude that we can do it, that the bar is 
low enough for us to jump over. So here we're getting now into some of the details from the Packer chapter. Um, Packer uh, outlines four crucial presupp presuppositions uh, in order to understand the biblical doctrine of grace. So, number one, Packer writes, is the moral ill desert of men. In other words, morally speaking, people do not deserve the grace of God. Our sins have separated us from God and merited eternal punishment. And God is not obligated to rescue his enemies. Packer points out that people often treat their small virtues as compensating for their great vices. And especially today, sin, if not outright promoted and celebrated, is often regarded as just a mental aberration or a physical disease rather than as a willful rebellion against uh, God's law. So, we do not deserve God's grace. That's the first presupposition. The second one, uh, the retributive justice of God. So, this, what that means is God is going to punish sin. That's uh, explain a little bit more clearly. God is going to punish sin. Well, why is that uh, unwanted news? Why is that something that, that uh, repels people? Well, it's because people tend to turn a blind eye to their own wrongdoing and to tolerate it in others as long as it doesn't, as long as they safely can, as long as it doesn't impinge on, on, on my business. And since we think we human beings think that, uh, you know, we, we turn a blind eye. We, even Christians, we sometimes just let things go when we shouldn't. Uh, and we project this open-mindedness on the God. We think, well, this way we operate, God must operate that same sort of way. Well, on the other hand, people often also react with rage. Okay, so on the other side, not just turning a blind eye, sometimes it's rage. Uh, when there's a speck in, in another's eye and that while ignoring the log in their own eye. So God, who has no sin, what is what's the truth? He perfectly measures our sins and calibrates his punishment that he's going to deliver with holy justification. You know, to use the phrase, being true to himself, you know, just be true to yourself. Well, God's going to be true to himself, and he's going to punish sin. All right. Number three. So God's going to punish sin. Well, maybe one might think, all right, so if I know God's going to punish sin, then I'm going to get my act together. I'm going to pull myself up by my moral bootstraps, and uh, try to make things right with God, get back on his good side. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that man is spiritually impotent, no power. You know, we cannot repair our re relationship with God. We do not even desire outside of Christ. We have no desire to repair our relationship with God. You know, it takes an act of uh, God's grace to change one's heart, to change your heart uh, to accept him. But that's, that's his work alone. That's, that's the Holy Spirit breathing life into those dead bones in the valley. Uh, instead, pagans, past and present, you know, have created their own religiosity. You know, worship carved images and perform terrible sacrifices and perverted forms of religion. So... That's, this is man having some understanding that there's, there's something broken and something sinful, but not having the true uh, power 
an understanding to make things right. So what, 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 if, what have people done? Well, they've worshipped blocks of wood and, and images of stone and, uh, and performed terrible sacrifices. Now, maybe modern churchgoers are a little bit more sophisticated, right, and uh, nuanced, but uh, no less self-deceived when they believe it's their own respectability that they've defined and created and set a goal for, or conveniently flexible morality. That's going to earn God's favor, or at least not deserve his you know, eternal punishment. And the fourth presupposition that, uh, that Packer outlines is that is the sovereign freedom of God. And this really offends a lot of people that, you know, God is not under our control, that God's not going to operate in the way I think, if I were God, that I would operate, right? God is not obligated to pity and to pardon. And God's mercy and compassion do not depend on man's will, but on God's will. So grace is free, Packer says, in that it originated in the one who was free not to be gracious. So in sum, uh, God's grace is love that he has freely shown towards guilty sinners contrary to their merit. But more than just a pardoning goodwill, you're, you're, you're forgiven, a wave of the hand, God's grace has a purpose to it. And that purpose is our salvation. So grace and salvation belong together uh, as cause and effect. So let's look at a couple of verses if you all wouldn't mind picking these out. Ephesians 2.5. And I'm saying we would jump on two, Titus 2.11, Ephesians 2.5. I have Titus 11. Two, Ephesians 2.5 is just a bit too blurry for me to read. Even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we made us alive together with Christ. By grace we have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Excellent, thank you. And Titus 2.11. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people. So again, it's God's grace had a purpose to pardon, but also to save his people. Okay, God's grace brings about our salvation. Our salvation is free to us. Fantastic. Right? But our salvation was not without a cost to someone. To draw his people to him, God had to turn his back on his own son. To give us God's riches, Jesus, God the Son, had to become a slave. To give us life, the Son of God died. So there's the, something that's always to be remembered when we, when we talk about grace. You know, grace is free. It pardons. It saves. It was free to us in Christ. And Christ had to give. The cost was, was great and terrible. So uh, a little bit more from Packer here. The, the New Testament sets forth God's grace in three particular connections. Grace is the source of the pardon for sin. So God, uh, God showed his great holiness by utterly punishing sin in the sacrifice of the unblemished divine one. So how do we see that God is, is holy? Well, by the, by the size and the magnitude of the sacrifice. It wasn't going to just be 
in a small sacrifice to show his holiness and God's uh, great and divine disregard for sin, the punishment had to be of one who was worthy to take that on. It was of the, had to be of someone who was innocent, had to be of someone who was divine. But he also, God showed his great love by punishing his son in our place. Grace is a motive of the plan of salvation. So we don't receive, we kind of said this before, we don't receive pardon and nothing else, but also salvation. So God desired to have an eternal relationship with those whom he loves, and by his grace, the gift of his son, our imputed righteousness has bridged that former separation. And it was a plan uh, born in God's overflowing gracious love for his people. From pre-creation election at the cross, redemption and justification, ongoing sanctification and future glorification. And grace is a guarantee of the preservation of the saints. So that, that, uh, uh, that our uh, salvation was unearned by us should be of great comfort uh, and God's sovereign election should be of great comfort to us. Why? Because it's, I don't need to fear. Unmerited grace led me to faith in the first place. And that same grace will keep me believing until the end of my life. The Holy Spirit is a seal of God's promise and work. And the end of my life begins heavenly glorification. Uh, as uh, Packer writes, doctrine is grace, ethics is gratitude. So again, some say that the doctrine of God's grace, we, we touched on this before, encourages moral laxity, you know, uh, with a, a low view of God's law. You know, we've been saved. We don't need to be worried about being condemned anymore. But Paul says, Paul writes, may this, may this, in other words, continuing to sin so grace may abound, may this never be. Instead, we must walk in the newness of life. Uh, God's love for us should awaken our love for him. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, to, and which are summed up with, you know, love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So again, in, in contrast to uh, cheap, free grace, get out of jail, free card, carte blanche, Right? Instead, uh, we need to walk and we are daily we we should be in the word, we should be praying, Lord, how can I how can I love you? How can I keep keep your commandments today? You know, not skirt them. So uh, anything uh, you want to add as we come to the end of thirteen. Dan. I was just thinking about our, our culture of mildew where, um, as, as we said earlier, you know, the box things that uh, are not regarded as sin, you know, grace is not needed, etc. But then there's certain uh, sins in our culture that are considered so bad that, that, that they're essentially irredeemable, you know, and, and, uh, and, and yet God's grace is so great, you know. A good point, and Dan said it eloquently, just to repeat a portion of it, um, you know, every sin, I mean, again, we, I think sometimes we tend to categorize really ba- bad, really bad, somewhat bad, down to, eh, not so bad, right? 
But as Dan said, reminded us, uh, every sin is really an, an affront to God. And God forgives all of those sins, can forgive all of those sins. Kurt. Another way that people can misuse the law. I mean, the scriptures say the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Is to, oh, okay, so I have to obey the law. And so they subjectively either pick out those uh, virtues that they believe themselves have and pat themselves on the back and say, I really am doing what God says to do. Or, or they'll look at other parts of the law and they'll, they'll reinterpret them in a way where they don't come off as bad, like the Pharisees did, and they externalized the law. So it made it okay for them to think bad thoughts about their neighbor as long as they didn't go out and kill them or punch them in the face. Then they were okay. So they make the law easier for them to fulfill by exchanging it with their own traditions. And to run a tangent off what you're saying, uh, uh, when Jesus explained uh, the law, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, it, those thoughts count. Yeah. Uh, those thoughts of, uh, it's not just uh, the act of murder, it's the, the hatred of a person which is murder. It's not just the physical act of adultery, it's the, the lusting in the heart that is, that is adultery. Yes. The, 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 other, the other way that you can also apply it in a bad way is through legalism. For example, uh, the, the, the circumcision sect, they, they said that you, you still need to do circumcision. Um, and and uh, they, they, were at, they were wrong in, in their application. Uh, they, were, they were actually applying legalism. Thank you. All right, let's uh, let's jump to chapter fourteen. I want to start that with a with a quote. Uh, one of my favorite quotes. <laughs> it's a terrible quote, but it's only my favorite quote because it's it sets up uh, my actual favorite one of my favorite quotes. The response. So you, you need this this uh, kind of rotten idea to to. Uh, to buttress the, uh, the response. So anyway, you've heard this before. Religion is the opiate of the people. You've heard that right? Or uh, the full quote. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of, a soulless, con of, uh, soul of soulless conditions. It is the opiate of the people, Karl Marx. Religion is the opiate of the people. Well, this was... Uh, probably butcher his pronunciation of the name, Cheslaw Milos, who was the 1980 uh, Nobel Prize winner for literature. And he wrote this 25 or so years ago. He said, a true opium of the people is a belief in nothingness after death. The huge solace of thinking that our betrayals, greed, cowardice, murders are not going to be judged. So I put that in there because uh, chapter 14 um, is uh, about God the judge. So we're going to take a quick look at that. You know, many s seem not to believe in a God who judges. You know, atheists and agnostics often mock such belief as, as fear-mongering. And an increasing number of churches tolerate and celebrate sin rather than lovingly preach the need for repentance. They think that our tolerance for sin is how God operates. We said this before. Jesus is just, he's the gregarious teacher. He's not the slaughtered lamb. But the Old Testament and the New Testament make it clear. God is a judge of all the earth. He's a judge of nations and he's a judge of of individuals. Uh, Packer outlines four concepts involved with God being a judge. 
So these are just kind of general characteristics of a judge. So Packer writes, a judge is a person with authority. All right, pretty basic definition. Uh, and so why does you know, God have authority as our judge? Well, he's a creator. And so since God created everything that there is out of nothing, I mean, there was, there was nothing, God said, let there be, let there be, let there be. He has the right uh, to make laws for his creation. Uh, a judge, number two, a judge is a person uh, who is identified with what is good and right. You know, so God is not the, the judge of an annual chili cook-off, right? One of the winners over here. <laughs> <laughs> so what is God the judge of? But he's the judge of behaviors and morality in the light of the standard of his holiness. You know, and God is not a, a, a dispassionate judge, cold and he is a told, uh, cold towards good and evil. He loves justice. Justice is delightful to God, and he hates rebellion, and he hates ill treatment of others. And he expects the same of us, to hate sinfulness, not the sinner, but to hate sinfulness, starting with the sinfulness of my heart. Start the hatred of sin there, and to delight in good there. But also not to tolerate sinfulness elsewhere. Number three, a judge is a person of wisdom. Who discerns truth. You know, a judge sits at the bench and listens to all the facts and renders a judgment. Well, God is a mission. You know, he already knows all the facts. And his omniscience extends not just to the things that the defense and the prosecution present to him. You know, God, God's omniscience extends to all hidden things. He searches hearts. He knows all secrets, and he perceives our thoughts even before we think them, as we read in Psalm 139. And his word, and, and that you know, God knows all this, and he, he knows the extent of our sinfulness. That's, that's not a secret to us. He's accurately described all this, the depth of our fallenness in, in the Bible. Well, so... The judge has authority to write laws. He, he's identified with good and right laws. He, he has the wisdom to figure out um, who's doing good, who's not doing good and right. But then number four, God is a judge. And a judge is a person who has the power to execute sentence. So God legislates. He sentences and he punishes. And there will be a final judgment. The New Testament's main authority on judgments is Jesus, the gregarious teacher, right? He's, Jesus will be the Father's agent in judgment, as many passages declare. Matthew 25, John 5, the Father has given all judgment to the Son, Every person will have to stand before the risen Christ. So the justice that God expresses, as we said before, is retributive. He will render to each individual person what he or she has deserved for the works committed and omitted. And for those who sought themselves, who sought righteousness in their own standards, who rejected God's standards, that justice will be expressed with eternal wrath. For believers, believers will also have to appear before the judgment seat to be recompensed for good and bad, as 2 Corinthians 5 says. The believer will be saved, but any works that are of wood, hay, and straw, in other words, 
uh, impure, weak, not good works, sinful things, those will be judged with a, with a loss of reward. But the believer himself will be saved. So even we will have to stand and give an account. Uh, final judgment will be according to knowledge. Uh, nature makes clear that a, that a creator God exists. Luke 12, 48 says, those who have received much, you know, much will be expected. And Jesus was uh, telling those whom he was preaching to and, and doing many miracles before, he says, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah you know, cities that are, uh, are connected with uh, uh, terrible carnal sins and things of that ilk, he says, Jesus says it's going to be more tolerable for them in the day of judgment than for the city, that nice, clean, American city with all the churches where Christ was preached and ignored. The doctrine of final judgment is so, you know, that being said, you know, again, we mentioned this before, some people say, well, this, you're just, uh, you're, you're, this is a scare tactic, you know, this final judgment is a, it's to scare people into, into, uh, into salvation or to coming to church or something like that. Well, that's not primarily, as Packer points out, what final judgment is. It's, it does have frightening implications, but its main thrust is to reveal God's moral character. The judge who loves goodness, delights in, in, uh, in goodness and rightness, who hates evil, he's going to perfectly and rightfully, with uh, his divine authority, judge sin, and it's going to be it's going to be terrible for those who have rejected him. So, just a, just a side thought. Um, you know, the, the person who asks, what, why does evil exist? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a question you get when, when you're on the boardwalk chapel or you're talking to people. Like, okay, if there's really God out there, you know, uh, why is he letting all this, all this sin go? Why, how could evil exist if God's so powerful and, and right and good? So what I think the, the real question perhaps underlying that is, is, uh, maybe somebody's asking, why does evil go unpunished or seem to go unpunished? Well, in the final judgment, you know, not a single evil deed will be forgotten or unpunished. Our sins, sins of those who love God and trust in Christ, they've already been punished. They are punished at the cross on Christ who, who bore our sins for us. But unbelievers' sins, it will take all eternity for their punishment to be carried out. So, just a, just a couple of questions here in closing. Now, th this is a this is a uh, a statement that uh, that offends some Christians, and they say, "Well, you're really misapplying." this. Um, you're taking us out of context, but let me, let me explain. Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. You know, Paul writes that in Romans, uh, quoting Malachi. So the, the way I see this, the way many see, Christians see this is, is again, God has complete autonomy. God by the secret counsel of his own will, he has loved some unto salvation and not others. And that, that's an offensive thought to, to many people. And uh, one thing to bear in mind is, you know, as we mentioned, God was under no compulsion to love anybody. All of us have sinned terribly. Every single one of us, me included especially, do not deserve to be loved by God. Never earned it. So God was under no compulsion to love anybody, yet he loved. He has loved many. He has loved his people. 
Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. But why can't we, if I'm throwing this question, why can't that be our attitude towards people around us? Say again? Okay, so what do you mean by, I mean, yes. Okay. Good point. Love our enemies. Kurt? In connection with this, I'm glad that God doesn't tell us. Um, we, we can tend to be judgmental already of, of people. What church do you go to? Oh, I don't go to a church. And we can be tempted to be judgmental of people mm-hmm. because they don't go to church. But how much more would that be the case if we knew the eternal destiny of the person in front of us? that they were never going to believe the gospel. It would make it harder for us to be kind and gracious to that person because we think we were wasting our time. So it's a great mercy and grace that we do not know, uh, that we don't see a mark on somebody's head. But instead, God says, go into the world, preach the gospel to all creatures, Mm -hmm. and show love to people whether they believe in you or not. That's hard enough as it is. So I'm glad that we don't know, don't have this kind of knowledge that God does. Well put, thank you. We're called David. to treat others as we want to be treated. Um, of course. I had the privilege of going into people's homes to take care of them. And um, I met some kind of like real irritating people that were weird. When you're on their turf, their mood shifts from the day they were in the hospital. Mm. So now they're in. Could you all hear what Chris was saying? Chris has served as a nurse going into homes of people who are really in, in, in a bad place. And, and Chris was saying that, you know, in the hospital, and maybe the medical staff has, a, has the power in the home, uh, the, the attitude of the patient often changes and that, that patient has, has the power and can evidently be irritating at times, Chris is saying. And uh, Chris is saying beautifully how she was reminded that God would remind her that uh, I made this person my image. And that's how you need to treat this person, as somebody who's created in my image. What a judge we have in Jesus. So why should believers be thankful that they worship a judge? Dan. You know, those, those characteristics of a judge that, you know, Packer outlined, that God has in, in fullness and the full divinity, that, you know, he has authority he, and that he loves, he's a judge, but he's a judge who loves good and, and who delights in good and he hates evil 
And we should be thankful that that's, that's our judge, that we don't have a, uh, a, a judge who's uh, inconsistent and who's, who comes and goes with the tide and the temperature, you know. He's a, he, he, he loves good things and he, he hates evil. Um, how does Jesus' role as judge affect our relationship with him? And these are just questions that came to mind. I don't even have an answer for it. So, Kurt. You know that he's not Santa Claus. You know that he is someone who goes by the truth and doesn't lie. And he's all, if, if he said, I'll justify you, I'll declare you righteous based on my son Jesus Christ through faith alone, he won't go back on you. And so I know his judgment, judgment is just and sure. And I can rest in that, knowing that my future is secure if I trust him. Yes, ma'am. I know he won't make mistakes because he is all seeing and all knowing, and he will do what is appropriate and also what is balanced. That he won't make, he won't deal with uh, a penalty that is extreme for what he sees or what is appropriate. Yes, very much. Yes, sir. I think it's um, reassuring to know that the judge is also the person who pays the penalty yes. mm -hmm. and is also our advocate. So um, that just makes us, or at least makes me, very uh, sure of my salvation. Very good point. Anything else? Kurt. This is something we don't often think about, but uh, Jesus is going to judge the righteous according to their good works, not to, as to whether they get to heaven, but what, what he, get, he is giving them rewards for the good things that people do. And I know that's a motivator for me when I know, uh, well, this people have not recognized that I've done this and this and this. And that's less of a blow because I know Jesus sees it. And he is pleased with it. And he is the one who's going to give rewards. And so uh, I, it, is, it is very comforting to think that I don't need to be recognized. That God has it all taken care of. And that he is a righteous judge. For a believer. The other side of that is what it says in uh, Romans 12. It says, vengeance is mine, but repay says the Lord. So we do not return evil for evil. We wait for the, for the righteous judge to, right. um, to make things right. And the, there are some you know, evils done against us that we feel vengeful about. We seem to be clear cut even though it's not permitted to take vengeance. But then other, you know, ills done to us that we may be very mistaken on. So it's even a caution there, too. You know, the God, God sees everything, and he knows when and where and how to, to take vengeance because he knows everything that's happened in that circumstance. Yes. love as being a positive thing when it comes to evil and hate as being a negative thing when it comes to evil. That it's good to hate sin and it's good to hate what, you know, situations that might you know, add up to pretty sort of negative words. But to hate another human being seems to be a negative and don't think of God as having any negatives. How, how does that 
Jacob I have chosen? Yeah. As opposed to and Esau I have not chosen. Oh that yeah, that's that's the case and, and notice when they were when these were stated, these were stated after you know the life of Jacob and Esau. So I don't think there's any statement in the Bible anywhere during a life where God says I have I have hated this particular person. I mean, I've not, that's what it means. I've not loved this person as, as my child. And he knows before the foundation of the world who he loves and who he doesn't love. And, you know, he didn't look at Esau's life and go, oh, this guy's terrible. You know, uh, I'm not going to love him because he would look at Jacob the same way. This guy is terrible. He would look at Bob and say, this guy is terrible. I don't, I don't need to, I'm not under compulsion to love any of them and the salvation to redeem any of them. But in his, in, in his sovereignty, um, uh, again, uh, by his own authority, by, his, by the grace that is unmerited, he has, he has loved some. And he has loved Jacob, he has loved you, he has loved me, and uh, many, Lord willing, all of us here, Unto salvation, and you know, before the foundation of the world, he decided some he didn't, and uh, we don't know who those are. So we go out and preach, and you know, we're, we're, we have this blessing of being able to take part in, in uh, uh, you know, watering and and planting, but you know, God causing the growth in those whom whom He loves. There are two types of love that in God that theologians have, have put a distinguishing mark between. One is the love of benevolence, and that is how God, in his common grace, gives to everybody life and family and all sorts of blessings for the common, even though they don't love him at all. They hate him and they despise him, and they will go to their graves of cursing his name. And God loves them anyway in that way. He gives them good things and he's patient with them and he allows them to exist. And they can't curse his name unless he holds them on his lap, as it were. Just like a child can't slap a parent in the face unless they're sitting in their lap. Uh, the, the unbelievers of this world are tolerated and they have patience exercised for them and are given all these good outward things that they don't deserve. But there's a, a love of redemption and salvation that only comes to uh, the people that he has chosen to repent and believe. And he saves them to the uttermost and gives them um, a salvific grace that causes them to repent and believe in him and they'll be with God for eternity. So God shows absolute a type of love to all people, and sh uh, showering them with rain, giving them food, clothes, and interactions with different people. Uh, but his love of salvation is only given to some. And it goes on in that chapter in Romans, um, to talk about how what if God wanted to show his patience and his long suffering so that he's showing them good by being patient with them and long suffering even though they'll never believe him. and that's a part of the reason why he has allowed those people to exist and doesn't snuff them out of existence which is kind of ironic because when people come up and say like on the boardwalk where an unbeliever comes to you and complains about they're being bad in the if God were really to get rid of all the bad people, then you wouldn't be here. God's being patient with you. This is a sign of his patience. And so, but that's how I think about Romans 9. All right, let's pray in closing.